Welcome to Root Words, a podcast that explores agriculture and cooking's role in connecting us to our landscape and our communities. I'm Stephen Abatel. Root Words is a collaboration between Vermont Farmers Food Center, Shrewsbury Agricultural Education and Arts Foundation, and many other community members. The project began in 2017 and was made possible by support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as from this community. Throughout this podcast, you're going to be hearing stories from people around the Rutland County region in the heart of Vermont, a region rich in agriculture, family farms, a region that's a pastoral working landscape. These stories are going to be each little windows into what a regional food system really looks like on the community level. We're excited to introduce you to some passionate folks working with the land and with food and bringing communities together. So please pull up a chair and enjoy. As we heard last time on Root Words, a lot of Abenaki folks, as well as community partners, are rebuilding Abenaki foodways, growing, processing, and distributing Abenaki crops. I'm also tasked with coordinating the growers for the Abenaki Land Link project. So last year was the pilot year. This is the second year. It's really grown. Um, it's all about creating relationships, sharing people's time, resources, skills, and land provide food that Chief Don Stevens distributes. On this episode, we hear from a few Abenaki gardeners. Chief Shirley Hook of the Coas Abenaki. My name is Shirley Hook. I'm on uh, Council of Chiefs for the Kawasaki of the Coas. And we raise the, herb, uh, the native garden here. And that's who I am. I'm a gardener. And Michael Dakota. I'm a Nulhegan citizen. And on our tribal lands in Barton, we put in a tribal garden. And we put in the three sisters, mounds, beans, the corn, the squash. And later, we hear what it takes to get from garden to plate while we connect with Roland Beluto. My name is Roland Beluto. Uh, I'm a Malhegan citizen from the Northeast Kingdom, even though I live here in Vermo- uh, Milton. And Joe Bossen. Uh, my name's Joe Bossen, and I'm the founder and president of Vermont Bean Crafters, originally out of Bourbon Hill Farm in West Rutland, and currently out of uh, Cloudwater Farm in Warren, Vermont. I met Chief Shirley Hook in early September of 2020 to learn about her work tending the Abenaki Tribal Garden in West Braintree, Vermont. She's one of the warmest and most inspired folks I've spoken with on this project. And I'm not just saying that because she topped her day off with homemade chocolate cake on her front porch. I'd call her a total boss, but she's not a boss. She's a chief. Chief Shirley tends a wide variety of indigenous cultivars in the tribal garden. She uses the garden as a space to educate children about gardening and Abenaki culture and as a way to feed and engage with elders. The tribal garden is the seeds are most of them are Abenaki, and um, they have been found or gifted back to to the community, and that's what we're raising in our garden. Most of it is uh, beans, dried beans. We have the Kawasak corn, the sunflowers that go about 10 to 14 feet tall, um, squash and pumpkins, and I guess that's about it. Sometimes I raise gourds, but they didn't do well this year. I don't know, I think everybody deep down likes to plant flowers or plant something and just to see it grow and, and, and it makes you feel good and you, and you pass it on to members of the community, give them plants so they can grow some and smile when they go in the garden. Well, we're in like Newberry in this area and in the central part, more or less. If you look at a map, the Cisco is way up the northern part, Swanton area. Now, Hegan is in... Uh, Oh, I guess you'd call it Memphis Magog area, and El News down in the southern part, and then we're we're, we're here in Orange County and in, in Newberry area, and and uh, yeah, there's a lot of history. It's a lot of history, and most people don't know what it is. So if we can teach the children the right stuff in school, it'd be fantastic. I'm waiting for that. I think it's going to happen too. 
I just hope that more children can get involved in the programs that, that are around uh, so they can learn how to garden. And I know one of the little girls that's a citizen of the tribe, she's still gardening even though we couldn't meet up because of the virus. And she, she grew a lot of stuff for her, her parents' garden. I find that the Jacob's cat cattle bean really does well. And the corn does really well. You got to get a lot of it because it's only this big. But um, it tastes good and uh, we use it for chowders and stuff like that too. And so, but uh, it's cool. I and mean, we can make cor corn meal out of it too. And, but they've been, se they seem to be very hardy for this uh, climate. I don't put any pesticides, no nothing. We just put uh, cow manure um, on it and make sure it's, you know, the cows, it's regular cow manure, it's not that liquefied stuff. Uh, Mudu, we use, we use a lot of that. And um, no, we don't use, we pick the bugs off the potatoes and the lava. I mean, there's a lot of picking. You might have to do it twice or three times a day sometimes. But we don't put nothing on it because I don't believe in it. Uh -uh. Bad for the Mother Earth. The skunk beans are on the teepees and they are going to take another couple weeks before we can pick them. And we pick them and then we uh, shuck them out and we use them for, as dry beans, not like string beans. And then we got like five different kinds of beans, Abenaki beans. I pulled a lot of them because they were all already dry. And um, Cherokee tomatoes we have. And then the Kawasaki corn is down there. Look how tall that is, it's not very tall, it's very short. The first time I grew it, I didn't realize it was supposed to be really short and I thought I did something wrong. Come to find out, I wasn't wrong, it was just short. And then the Jerusalem artichokes are those. I don't know if you've ever had them before, but you can roast them or eat them raw or boil them. And they taste better roasted with onions. They're very good. And that's our potato field. But uh, I think that's the extent of it, the pumpkins and squash. And we've got a lot of squash. So, um, and then I had tobacco down there, but I harvested it already. And we got a lot of uh, different vegetables we've been giving away to some of the, a lot of the elders and whoever needs them or wants them. So uh, hopefully we can continue doing this. But uh, it's very spiritual as far as the, um, the gardens. And you can find, get yourself lost in the garden. But um, I really love it. It's so much fun. And I grow all the plants, all the tomatoes, cabbage, and I gave over 200 plants away this spring. And we had, I think, 38 tomato plants there. And in the other garden, the cabin garden, we got 61, I think it was. And then, of course, the cabbage, the broccoli, everything we grew. And I do have a little greenhouse, so I'm going to have to add on to it, I think. But everybody's got their list and what they want me to grow for them. I just like, love to see things grow. It's just fun. I love it. My grandmother always said there was one child that was taken from the family, and they sterilized them. And in the letter, there was two children that they did it to. They took them down to Brandon. And that's when the, the eugenics was going on. They wrote to my grandfather and he couldn't get back to Vermont fast enough to, to, to kind of go get him. And there's, they did that for years and years. And the weirdest part was the governor that signed it was from our, our town. Yeah, pretty sad. But it happened, I guess. Now they need, it needs to be righted around where people actually know about it. Most people don't. They look at you like, what? They knew it happened in the West, but they didn't realize it was here. The children don't learn it in school, but they will be learning, I think, eventually, hopefully in the very near future, uh, the true history of the Abenaki. And if we can keep that going and teach the kids about the, that we did have certain seeds that we have gifted back or whatever, it's important because we, we have been existing here for centuries and centuries. And even grown-ups don't know that. A lot of them don't. They don't even, they can't even pronounce the word. So it's like, we just got to get the word out there. And show them that we're still here. 
I think it's really important for for uh, anybody that wanted to to learn, and that's what part of the thing that we're trying to do down to the gardens. We have a, actually we have a shed down there now. It's called the Learning Shed, and uh, we're going to start little classes um, for teaching kids how to raise uh, seeds and plant them and take care of them and then harvest them. And um, this past year has been really terrible because of the pandemic and stuff, so we weren't able to meet up like we normally did. But uh, we delivered dirt, uh, you know, dirt, potting soil, um, the little greenhouses uh, that they have at the, at the store to start, the little starter plugs that you start. And um, they have that and, uh, and the seeds, of course, and anything they needed for, for raising the seeds or the seedlings, uh, they were, they, you know, we dropped it off at each of the people's houses so that the kids can continue growing the, their seeds. And then we'll teach people how to harvest them and what to do, like squash. Some of them, if they're winter squash, they'll last quite a while. Uh, they'll... Um, my parents used to put them underneath the beds upstairs at my grandmother's house, and uh, they'd, they'd stay good right up until spring. We had them, and, and every year my mother used to save the seeds. You know, she saved out so many uh, to make sure that we would have seeds for the following uh, planting season. And uh, actually, we do that here. We also have a seed um exchange like saying if anybody needed seeds or anything um, that all they have to do is contact me and, and if I have them they can have you know we'll give them to them and uh, if they want to learn how to grow their own seeds and stuff. It makes me feel good. I love gardening. My favorite. I don't know it's just it's just beautiful. It's just I love to do it. It, it warms your heart and soul. It's beautiful, no matter what. You look at it, and in some way, it's going to be beautiful. Even a weed. If you look at some of the weeds, they're beautiful. They have little flowers. And, wow, yeah. After veggies have been cared for and harvested, there's still work to do to preserve and distribute them to tribal citizens and others in the community. Most of the Abenaki land link harvest makes its way first to Joe Bossen, a Vermont bean crafters and All Souls Tortoria where it can be processed and preserved. Uh, my name's Joe Bossen, and I'm the founder and president of Vermont Bean Crafters, originally out of Bournemouth Hill Farm in West Rutland, and currently out of uh, Cloudwater Farm in Warren, Vermont. Yeah, one, one of a lot of, you know, the constituent pieces of it, and we basically um, just trying to be useful in whatever capacity we can be. And so last year that meant um, providing a uh, licensed kitchen space to be processing the squash, um, peeling, scooping, dicing, freezing. Um, and then um, this year, now that we have some land access, we also grew some Callis Apanaki flint corn and some skunk beans, experimented with different trellising for doing whole beans at scale in the Northeast and kind of on our learning curve with that. But yeah, just trying to um, basically bulk up the scale at which some of these things are happening both for the food sovereignty and like feeding of the tribe but then been also in conversation with um, Chief Don about taking some of those traditional crops and creating a product line for them that would be you know branded under the uh, tribal insignia and they would then have one more uh, revenue stream coming from you know those those crops so like you know a prepackaged one pound bag of dry beans, you know, the skunk beans, the true red cranberry beans, all that, and then also a cornmeal and different corn products and stuff like that coming out of those corns. So that's like the, what we're trying to build up the seed supply so that then we can partner with growers that can do stuff at a larger scale than the home gardeners. And then there'll still be the home garden aspect, but then there'll also be this value chain that we can build out over time as we mature the whole program. And so that's within, but then also a little bit on the the edges of, I think, what the original scope of the Abenaki Lumen project might have entailed. And I'm curious to see what emergent properties and ideas and other collaborations come out of the continuation of it all. <laughs> all about um, feeding folks in general. And so just, um, it's kind of an extension of, of that. And then uh, an element of why we, um, you know, wanted 
to do the growing this year, our first year of having tenure on our own farm, um, is that idea of just exploring being in right relationship with the land and, you know, just like very plainly sitting with the idea that, you know, there's all these systems that, um, however hard fought these opportunities are for us to be landed at this point in our lives, it's that much harder for many other people to get that same land tenure. So we want to take that privilege and use it um, to help be in service of folks that maybe have been disenfranchised from land access, either in the present tense or in past tenses. And so that's an early exploration of us trying to sort out that being in right relationship. And um, and then there's also just like a, a total inherent joy in working with some of those crops because all of them are absolutely gorgeous seeds. Yeah. And, you know, it's right up our alley working with beans and corn and squash and everything, too. Those are the things I ultimately want to be growing anyhow. So, And it makes sense to be growing ones that have a deep history in this climate and this land and all. Yeah. In the last episode, we heard from Chief Don Stevens of the Nulhegan Band of Abenaki about the tribe's goal to create a revenue source and community rallying point around a branded Abenaki food product. Joe is pitching in to support the Abenaki community in this goal. Like Chief Shirley, Michael Dakota projects joy speaking about his Nulhegan tribal garden, and when we met at the Landlink Harvest Festival, he told me about all the connections the garden creates to other human and animal communities. I'm a Nulhegan citizen, and on our tribal lands in Barton, we put in a tribal garden and we put in the three sisters mounds beans the corn the squash um the first year we tried it it was new soil that had just been tilled it was very wet and we got some ears of corn, but Osban got them before we could try to eat them. Um, Osban is the raccoon. Um, and the beans um, were a delight of Nolka the deer. <laughs> And we did manage to get some squash before Owasso's came, the bear. It sounds like there was a lot of people <laughs> waiting for you. To... There was a lot of people waiting for our crop. But that's part of our planting is we plant for our people to eat. We plant for anyone else who comes and needs food and we plant for the animals to eat so we don't go out and get mad at the bear or the deer for eating our corn and our beans and our squash because we planted some for them um, so <clears throat> we didn't get a lot of produce out of the first year's garden so we ran that one for three years um, and then um, we started partnering, partnering with uh, Sterling College and they would grow all of our three sisters. Um, and they soon found out that Awasos is very partial to our particular type of corn. Um, <laughs> and their first year Awasos got the majority of the corn. <laughs> We also now have partners within our tribe who grow some of our crops at home. Um, I alternate. This year I've got squash in. Next year I'll have tobacco. I'll plant lots of tobacco. And the third year I will plant um, beans. Tobacco is important for us because it's fully integrated into everything we do. It is for offering. Um, if we go out and harvest, we offer Mother Earth some Odomon tobacco for thanks 
for saying thank you for allowing me to harvest this for my people. Tobacco is for offering. Tobacco is to offer to the fire for the smoke to carry our prayers up. Tobacco is integrated into almost every ceremony we have. If you go to an elder, then you bring tobacco and you offer them tobacco for whatever it is you're going to ask them for. So it's, it's totally integrated. So I enjoy growing the tobacco. Um, I usually start it fairly early, end of January, February in the house, so I have nice hardy plants that go out. I plant anywhere from 25 to 40 plants, and that's enough to get me through the year in tobacco, or a couple of years, and to help out somebody else with tobacco as well. So tobacco is a fun one to grow. Um, squash is a great one to grow. Squash is a great one because it can be dried and preserved. Um, in today's today's world, we would preserve it by you know freezing it, um, or some of the squash can just be left in cool, dark areas until they're needed. Dry storage. The bear always gets the corn if it does grow, so I never really get to see the corn. <laughs> it's all part of a community. Abenaki has always survived by being a community that helps each other to benefit each other, not just for the sole benefit of one. Everything we do is to benefit our people. And sometimes our people is just our community, our tribe. Sometimes our people is the expanded community. You know, um, our, food, our food banks, they don't just serve Abenaki people. We use that food to help other people in the community. It's all about community, working together for the benefit of all. Oh, because we're stewards. We're, we're here by Mother Earth's grace. It's important not just to give thanks and appreciation to Mother Earth, but it teaches us every plant is a someone, even in our language. A plant is not just a plant, it's someone. It's a living someone. And I think a lot of people lose that. And when we give thanks to Mother Earth, we're acknowledging that that plant is someone, and we're taking someone. So we're giving thanks for that someone that that we're going to use. And we should be doing it with everybody we meet, not just Mother Earth. We should always be grateful for what another person gives us, whether it's friendship or something material or something spiritual. We should be grateful. And it starts with Mother Earth, because she gives us everything. Hopefully, I'll be able to make some significant changes. Um, I've been appointed to the Vermont Commission of Native American Affairs, so I'll be sitting on the board for at least one term anyway. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can find a way to improve community relations and reach out even further to expand the community to be much more inclusive. Abenaki citizens are pitching in to help distribute the Abenaki land link harvest to the community. I met Roland Bluto at the Harvest Festival, and he told me a little bit about how and why he decided to get involved. Uh, I'm a Mohegan citizen from the Northeast Kingdom, even though I live here in Verm uh, Milton. Part of my, uh, my thing that I like to do for the people is, is anything that I can do to help up our people. I'm retired, so that gives me a lot of free time to, to spare Don out on, on things, especially this food program that, that we're involved with, with uh, you people. Uh, he, he goes and picks it up. Uh, he gets a hold of me. Uh, 
We sort out what he needs for his people that he distributes to, and then I take the rest, and uh, I, I bring it to people in my area. I take care of uh, probably about nine or ten families, mostly the elderly. I, I take care of my own family, of course. And the elderly are most appreciative because if we can save them five or ten or twenty dollars a month in fresh vegetables, I mean they're 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 happy as all get out. So every every week when he picks up the the vegetables, I he calls me up. He says, "Come on down," and I go down and we sort it out. And that means some, you know, there's several bags of all kinds of stuff: radishes and lettuce and herbs and peppers and potatoes. We're getting potatoes now, uh, carrots. Yeah, it's a good program, uh, and so many people are benefiting from it. All the food that I go to is, is for the, the people in our tribe. Uh, if there's any leftover that nobody wants anymore, <clears throat> then I, I dole it out to people in my neighborhood that I know can use it. You know, So none of it goes to waste. Everything is used, and, and people are so, you know, especially in these trying times right now where, where prices are going up and everything, I mean, it's it's really a benefit to, to a lot of people. This came in just at the right time. I mean, you know, from the spring or early summer when the vegetables started coming in. So, yeah, it helps. And, and like myself, I mean, I'm on a fixed income on Social Security. So it, it saves me a few bucks every month. It makes me feel great. I, I, I love help. My, my thing, I love helping people, you know, whether it's helping Don distribute food or, or helping somebody build a barn or, or going over and helping one of my friends skin out a hide, you know, just, just a great thing to do. That's, that's what we do, you know, we help each other. We're all in this together. And... The Abenaki Land Link Project addresses the overlapping challenges of how to develop contemporary Abenaki foodways inside a Western colonized food system while creating food security for a people historically removed from land access. The project also opens opportunities for Abenaki and non-Abenaki folks to partner on solutions to these complex challenges. If you would like to support the Abenaki in their journey towards food sovereignty, you can connect with Zia Luce at Nofa Vermont about becoming a Landlink grower and by keeping an eye out for Abenaki branded products. This episode was produced by Stephen Abatel. Special thanks to Chief Shirley Hook, Michael Dakoto, Roland Bluto, and Joe Bossen. To learn more about the Abenaki Landlink program or to sign up as a grower, visit nofavt.org. Learn more about Chief Don Stevens's food sovereignty work at abenakitribe.org. And to learn more about what Joe Boston is up to in the kitchen, check out vermontbeancrafters.com. Our musical themes are by the Salt Ash Serenaders. We are a project of the Vermont Farmers Food Center and Sage. Thank you all for listening and for being a part of our local food system. We'll catch you next time on Root Words. Hello, friends. For those of you that have stuck around this long, I'd like to treat you to a chapter of Chief Shirley Hook reading from her 2019 autobiographical memoir, My Bring Up, published by Karango Books. Please enjoy. The planning and harvesting of our food. This time of year, the smell of spring is in the air. Everywhere you look is a rebirth of sorts. The sounds of the bird's songs fill this still air with a magic for living. This brings back a lot of memories of the 50s and 60s when we were probably about six and seven. My sister and I would take a bushel basket and head for the fields to dig dandelion greens. When the basket was filled, we headed back to the water house and cleaned them. It took some patience to get all the dried grass and field soil off in them. We would help mother put the greens in glass canning jars and put it through the pressure cooker. It seemed like hours that we waited over the old high chair. The pressure cookers were different than the ones we have today. There was a gauge on them and you had to get the 
screens to a certain pressure and then lower the heat, but make sure it maintained the pressure for a given amount of time. I remember sitting there for hours watching the gauge and just waiting to be outside. My grandmother used to tell a story about my uncle regarding canning. He was watching the same canner, but probably daydreaming, and he forgot what he was doing. The canner blew up and put a hole in the ceiling. My eyes would dart to the ceiling where the outline of the canner lid was still visible, a reminder to watch the gauge because the same thing might happen to you. What a dreadful thought. After the greens were canned, they were toted down to the cellar where they remained until needed. The garden planting started after dandelion season. The potatoes would go in, probably 200 pounds of them. If we had the money, Dad would get seed potatoes from the grain store. If not, we would save some of the ones that we harvest from the year before and plant them. All of us were involved with the planting. Dad had a doodle bug. He never owned a tractor. And he would plow and harrow potato peas and take an old horse prep plow that he rigged up to make the rows. The next planting was a regular garden, the usual corn, string beans, kidney beans, shell beans, all sorts of squash, tomatoes, onions, etc. We're planting in a huge garden. There were usually three or four areas that we would plant. Every year the gardens were rotated. If you didn't do that, the gardens would be full of disease and unwanted insects. Say nothing about depleting the soil. When the first little green shoots would appear through the warm earth, the weeding would start. That was a chore and a half. At the same time, it seemed that was all we did. It was, of course. The haying came next. My sister and I were taught how to run the doodle bus. We were so small that we had to stand up in order to see over the steering wheel. At a snail's pace, we would be off. My father would cut the hay. Mother would rake it up and throw the loose hay on the wagon. It also had to be trampled down so we can get a lot more on the wagon. With the wagon overflowing with the sweet, dry grass, a hay, we would go to the hay mail where we would unload the precious winter food for the cows. In August, we would start to harvest and can our vegetables. From early morning until the dusk arrived, we canned. We usually put away between 800 and 1,000 quarts of our winter food supply. You would can all you had because the next year might not yield anything due to the weather, bugs, or blight. The root vegetables consisted of onions, carrots, turnips, beets, potatoes, squash, pumpkins, all were into, into the cool cellar. We also raised our own meat. We raised hogs, beef, chickens, and ducks. Mr. Phelps would make his rounds to the area farms to kill the animals and prepare them. Dad made the, made the hog up into lots of ham. He had an old barrel where he built a fire a certain way to smoke the hands. We also made salt pork and bacon. Every part of the animal was used. Nothing was wasted. The beef was mostly canned. When my grandmother um, bought a freezer, we would freeze some. It seemed rather funny that we had a freezer, but no refrigerator. The chickens and ducks provided us with eggs and meat. Fall was for coon hunting. All of us kids would pile into our our old out-of-date car, along with our old red bone dog. Dad would be in the driver's seat. Off we would go. Dad and the grown-ups would let the dog go, and he would find a coon in a tree, and then the grown-ups would shoot it. We stayed in the dark, ghostly car, waiting for the return of the hunters. A lot of times it was scary, but since we were the oldest, you couldn't tell the younger ones that you might be a tad scared. One night we were staring out into the night when someone came to the window and started knocking on the window. We had no idea who it was at that time, for we were miles from any one or any place. We rolled the windows down a bit, letting the stale hot air out. The short, fat little man had a funny hat on and a uniform on. Dang, if he had, didn't have a badge on. We were taught not to talk to strangers, much less roll the window down. His badge gleamed in the light of his flashlight. He also had a gun at his side, said nothing about the other people that person that was with him. He asked what our names were. Do we dare to tell him or not? Where is dad when you need him? My brother spoke up and said, my dad's out catching coons. He's coon hunting. Badge man said, I don't think so. He's out shooting deer, isn't he? We all replied at once, no, dad and our dog are out catching coons. The conversation went on for a while. There was no way that we were going to convince them that dad was shooting deer. Finally, sh shots were fired. Yelps, barks, and whining from the dog were coming from over by the tree line. The badge man ran as fast as his little legs could carry him to, the, to arrest whoever it was, deer jacket. But he had wasted his time tonight because he was after the wrong man, the one that reported our dad was a true jacker. 
we did get a number of coons that night for the freezer. Coon was a big part of our meals back then. They weren't as sickly as they are now. Mom would cook them in vinegar to t tenderize them. They had a lot of fat on them, and Mother made sure that the fat was all taken off. We also ate woodchuck, rabbits, and other wild game. Deer, hunter was, deer hunting was in November. Nearly every family in the hills would get their license and head to their favorite hunting area. Sometimes the family would get a deer. After they harvested it, they hung it upside down for a while to tenderize it. Then it was cut, that, cut up and usually canned. We learned how to survive in very little. I am glad I was brought up that way. We learned how to make do with what we had. There were only a few years in my life that I haven't raised a garden. In 2010, we canned or froze over 400 quarts of vegetables, 400 pounds of potatoes, a bushel of onions, many different types of squash, pumpkins, etc. were put into the cool storage. Doug harvested the deer and an elk. The meat was canned and frozen. The fish were caught and were frozen. We purchased 40 pounds of fresh chicken that was put away. We only go to grocery store for very little. I really love to go down to the storage room and open the doors to the cupboards to look at all the beautiful colored canned goods, knowing that if we were unable to go for months, we still have everything we need and can survive. <laughs>